Go ahead. Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Edgar, for the introduction, and uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, joining this morning. It's a real pleasure to be able to uh, talk to you about um, the topic of decentralization and, uh, in particular, to reflect very uh, briefly, I suppose, and in small snippets about uh, what we should expect in terms of, um, of um, decentralization in uh, the coming election. Are you seeing, sorry, uh, I know my screen is shared, but um, okay, there we go. Yes, yeah. that's fine. Good. So what we want to do today, Alex and I, we want to uh, essentially uh, make an argument that maybe is obvious, but in fact is uh, not necessarily so in particular for those of you who joined last week and um, heard uh, some updates on the expectations in the peace process and what armed groups and the government are negotiating towards, which is uh, an aspiration for some sort of agreement on, on federalism, particularly on the side of the armed groups. Uh, the flip side of this is to think about what, at what state uh, is Myanmar finding itself in terms of decentralization at the moment? Uh, and so we're drawing a little bit on the work we've done in our in our project as well as other information to give you a bit of a of a quick snippet on what is the state of decentralization at the moment and where uh, we see it potentially going. So um, our argument is that decentralization is a political process, not a predetermined and unavoidable outcome. There often seems to be a sense that. Um, that decentralization is something that will inevitably happen to some degree, and there's been a lot of work that are pointing in those directions. And our argument is to be a little bit more skeptical uh, about, about this, in part because uh, we think that the political pressures have to be there in order for decentralization to actually occur. And we come to this conclusion really looking at um, what is the current state of decentralization, what, what it actually looks like. So there's been uh, basically a lack of decentralization included in the 2008 constitution. Uh, we want to point to uh, where the state of popular opinions through surveys that we conducted uh, in terms of uh, decentralization, and we can, and, and our conclusion is that those opinions are not uh, really crystallizing one direction or the other. Uh, there's third, an increasing role uh, of NAPIDA in people's lives through development, but not necessarily through decentralization. That that is having an independent impact as well. Uh, and then finally, that uh, decentralization will probably not be a 2020 election uh, issue, won't be central. Decentralization tends to be happening a lot more behind the scenes, whereas maybe the peace process is a little bit more uh, on the upfront. But even the peace process is unlikely to play a very central role in the election. When we look at the constitution of 2008, it's pretty striking um, when we compare to any other country, the extent to which um, the, the constitution is highly centralized, that the elements that pretend to be uh, elements of decentralization are in fact uh, themselves as well, uh, very limited in their, uh, in their uh, capacity to de decentralize towards state governments. So without going into enormous amount of detail, just pointing out uh, what are the core elements of, of the constitution that would need to be rethought if uh, true decentralization were to occur. Uh, at some, uh, first of all, the jurisdictional powers, um, they have a, a, an interesting way of having divided the jurisdictional powers rather than uh, selecting certain powers that are allocated to states and uh, certain powers that are allocated to, uh, to the central government. What we have are in each sectors, whether it's the economic sector, agricultural and fisheries, energy, electricity, mining, forestry, all of the important areas uh, for ethnic minority areas, uh, all of those have basically some major powers that are reserved at the central level. And then there are some very specific designated powers uh, that are then uh, uh, delegated to, to the, the state level. So when we look through the, the powers that are, that are provided, I'll give examples. Um, small scale energy projects are, are at the state level, but larger energy projects are under the, the central government. Policy, uh, polishing of gems is at the state level, but 
all the um, the uh, management of the uh, gem sector, jade uh, mining and, and other um, resources, mineral resources are uh, still controlled by the central government. Uh, forestry is basically under central government, but village firewood would be uh, a power that state governments would have. So when you look over overall at the uh, at the jurisdictional powers, they're very very limited uh, at the uh, at the state level, and a lot of the powers that are actually provided are basically uh, under a model of deconcentration deconcentration rather than decentralization. There's not a very clear demarcation between what is the state government as an independent uh, uh, government with its own sort of jurisdictional power and where it has responsibility for essentially implementing uh, the um, the uh, laws and regulations from the central government. So essentially, there's a lot of overlap, and it's constitutionalized in that way. And the laws that have followed through are also creating enormous amount of overlap between state and central government, so that it 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 leaves the central government with enormous amount of powers, even in those minimal areas in which uh, state governments have uh, the possibility to have some uh, independence. Other powers in the Constitution are outside of, um, the, of, of specific jurisdictions uh, the chief, that also dilute and, or contradict, contradict state powers. Chief ministers, which are the uh, top executive uh, position in, in, at the state level, are appointed by the central government. The military continues to hold 25% of seats in state parliaments, as well as the national parliament, um, so essentially has a, a veto uh, over a lot of, of legislation. Um, there's no autonomous bureaucracy. The state government is not supported by its own bureaucracy. It's a very, very, very small number of people. Most of the uh, bureaucracy that supports uh, any of the programs at the state level are essentially line ministries, offices of line ministries from uh, the central government uh, with a small section that is uh, implementing part of the uh, independent agenda that the state uh, bureaucracy has. And finally, pretty much for all levels of accountability, uh, there are uh, state governments as well as all uh, different levels of management and bureaucracy uh, are directly accountable to NAPIDA, uh, even for some very small uh, decisions that need to be made. So. There's very little uh, in the Constitution, in fact, uh, in the way in which the Constitution is implemented to uh, back decentralization. When we look overall over the last 10 years, what has been achieved, um, there's very little again. I mean, if we think about um, the state powers, uh, there are uh, some limited abilities for law lawmaking activities, and there's been a few reports that have come out that have shown how it has given more voice at the state level. Uh, there are There is more debate. Um, there is uh, some uh, very limited lawmaking activity. So at least it's, it's, it's the beginnings of, I would say, um, uh, a, a democratic process uh, at, at the state level, but hasn't yet uh, translated into true uh, seizing uh, control, even within the limited areas that, uh, that parliaments have had. I'm generalizing across the board, but it's quite uneven at some levels. But when we look overall, particularly in minority ethnic areas, uh, state parliaments have really not seized uh, even those small opportunities that are given to them. The one big achievement of the NLD was to uh, was to um, take away from uh, the uh, Home Affairs Department, which, under, uh, which is under uh, the control of the military, the General Administration Department, which is uh, a very important section of the Home Affairs Department, which essentially controls a lot of the uh, implementation and uh, and and budget at the state uh, at the state level. So now that it's under civilian control, that has given some hope uh, that there would be a little bit uh, less um, interference from the military and might be uh, leading towards decentralization. But uh, it's simply uh, a, uh, the civilian government that has taken control, and we've not yet seen uh, a trickle down to uh, more control at the state level coming from this uh, uh, GAD um, uh, transfer to civilian authority.
looking at one area, simply one area that we would think might be logically uh, decentralized at some point in the future, uh, education remains enormously centralized. And there's a lot uh, to be said for some measure of decentralization that, that should occur in this area. For example, the, the curriculum has uh, for the longest time been centralized. The government has just gone through a very significant curriculum review, but it remains a national curriculum with very minimal concessions on language and culture, despite the fact that this has been a main area that ethnic minorities have been, uh, been uh, asking for. Um, there are some difficulties that continue of course, in terms of, um, of <clears throat> transitioning to higher levels of education uh, for many uh, ethnic minorities who uh, are worried that if they had uh, a local curriculum that they might be disadvantaged in terms of uh, reaching higher, uh, higher levels of, of uh, education. Uh, but for the most part, uh, even though the new curriculum is it has has reflected on introducing more language and local culture, it has found it has been fairly uh, continued to be uh, fairly difficult to um, to provide a system that would allow uh, more sort of local content and and still not create uh, impediments for progress to higher education for uh, ethnic minorities. Um, this is compounded by the fact that armed groups have uh, education systems in at least two areas, the Mon and uh, the Karen have a fairly extensive education system, uh, and yet, and, and there's been some problems that have come with transitioning or, or moving away from uh, a, 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 an education system under territories controlled by armed groups and attempting to integrate these to a Myanmar education system. They're trying to leverage, of course, the ability to main, to preserve what are some uh, very strong areas of language and culture. Uh, that they are able to provide to their local populations. Uh, other issues that arise when it comes to uh, problems of uh, education management is that uh, there are a lot of the, uh, the logistics in education, uh, whether it's building schools, whether it's providing uh, additional resources, difficulties uh, that have to do with gender differences, uh, and and uh, and uh, reflecting some of the the, uh, the real problems with um, with uh, having a functional education system in areas such as Chin State, which is very mountainous, uh, the local bureaucracies are very limited, and therefore they have very uh, few resources to uh, basically being able to address what are more locally based um, locally based um, uh, obstacles. Um, the, the priorities become those that the central government has been implementing across uh, Myanmar rather than reflecting those local needs. And then finally, there's a consistent uh, problem in all areas with uh, poor teacher uh, training, uh, textbooks are missing uh, and, 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 or, or difficult to produce in the local languages and culture. And, and locally, they do not have the resources uh, for uh, developing these more extensively. So uh, there's, a, there's a great potential for uh, expanding uh, decentralization in education, but the obstacles are huge. Um, our survey was showing um, in terms of management of two sectors, education and health, just by comparison. Uh, and we have, I just have a couple of slides here to show you uh, some of how some of this is reflected in our survey results. And we're looking at uh, Kachin, Chin, Magwe is a, 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 a Bama, so dominant group, majority uh, area, and then Kayin is Karen state. Uh, when we look at uh, do they have to speak Burmese with local officials uh, in education and health? Uh, we can see that uh, Chin State is better than others, but Kayin and Kachin, both in terms of health staff and education staff, more than 40% uh, need to use uh, Burmese language rather than lo their local language in order to receive services. Uh, in terms of whether the staff have the same ethnicity, particularly this has been something that a lot uh, of people raise as important in terms of healthcare and of course in terms of their teachers. Uh, but when we look at the, uh, the staff, uh, we, we, we can see that in a place like Chin State, more than 60% are not from Chin State. That includes a lot of the teachers, uh, Kayin and uh, Kachin as well. So this is just uh, to show you a little bit on one example of an area or two that are, are, are quite significantly still centralized. If we compare with other countries in the region, for instance, we can see that, uh, according to this World Bank uh, review, that Myanmar continues to have, in terms of functional allocations, education, health, social welfare, some very important areas 
uh, for uh, local uh, state areas uh, are still very centralized relative to any of the other uh, countries in the region. So I'm going to turn to Alex, who's going to continue with a few more um, findings from our survey. Uh, Alex, did you want to yeah, go over at this point? I, can you hear me? Yeah. I think I took control of the screen. Can you see my PowerPoint? Yes. yes. Okay, great. So I will shift the, the conversation a little bit towards uh, the, the central question of this uh, webinar, which was uh, whether decentralization will play any role in the 2020 elections. Uh, and now that Jacques has uh, kind of gave the institutional and constitutional background, I will focus a bit more on opinion. Uh, and I will show some of con contradictory and sometimes finding uh, puz uh, puzzling findings from our survey, but also other surveys uh, when it comes to uh, decentralization. So one of the questions we asked is whether ethnicity is important at all for people in Myanmar. And we were surprised actually to find that Bama, which is the majority, uh, in Myanmar was as interested or, or found ethnicity as important as other groups in Myanmar uh, to be protected, language to be preserved, but also some form of autonomy to be achieved. But when we looked at um, whether they felt Myanmaris or Myanmaris first, we found, of course, uh, widespread differences between groups. And so what we see is that ethnic minorities generally don't feel uh, Myanmaris at all, while, while the Bama majority feel strongly Myanmaris. This is not puzzling or surprising, but what we find interesting is the gap between the minorities and the majority. And what we are arguing uh, in this uh, webinar is that this difference may play a role in the election. So it means that Bamar find it less conflictual to be strongly Bamar and have a strong central state at the same time, whereas we find that minorities find that there's more tension between their identity and the national identity. And we'll see this is reflected also in other uh, surveys on, on opinions about decentralization. So when, we, uh, when the uh, People's Alliance for Credible Elections asked people what were their priority in terms of uh, what was the most important problems at the national level, we see that constitutional reform rang very, very, very low in people's mind or in people's priority. Mostly people find that conflict and peace is the priority, but also the economy, government services and infrastructure and law and order. Um, now, this may be related to many things. Maybe decentralization is not a key question for them because they don't see what is the value of decentralization. But other people also may be misreading what the Constitution grants as powers and, and, and jurisdiction to uh, states and regions. And we see that in, again, the same survey where people seem to think, uh, especially in uh, in regions that the state is much more decentralized than it is actually uh, than the state is actually, as as Jacques explained a little earlier, based on the 2008 Constitution. So there's a bit of a misconception, or people think maybe that the state is much more decentralized than it is. Though, so it it it, it affects their uh, assessment of whether decentralization has progress and whether decentralization is going to be one central issue of the next election. But I think the most important point is here when we look at what people think should be the right balance between the union government and the region and states, we see a lot of people that are undecided. That's what Jacques said about the uncrystallized, not yet crystallized opinion about decentralization. And I think this is where the decentralization process becomes political because both the central state is trying to capture people who don't know yet whether decentralization is important or not. And the state governments, well, they're also fighting for that portion of the, of the population that is not yet sure whether decentralization is important or not. So what we see here is, again, there's a gap between, uh, a small gap between the state and the region. So the regions are Bama majority and the states are minor, ethnic minorities, if you want. So as you can see here, um, a bit more of the state believe that the state should be uh, more powerful, but there's no huge consensus about whether decentralization is a priority. I was looking at data from Indonesia, for example, and about 65% of the population think that this, the, the local level should have more power. So there's a mud, much broad, broader based uh, consensus on whether decentralization should happen. So maybe it's because we're early in the process of decentralization, but I believe that this what we argue in, the, in, in this webinar is that we believe that this portion of, of uh, we don't know yet are an important uh, are important as a uh, uh, so the central government is trying to target them, convince them that decentralization is not necessarily important. And we see that between political parties, it's 
it's only ethnic parties that really believe that decentralization should be greater, but also below 50%. So again, in major parties, supporters of major parties, um, um, the desire for greater decentralization is relatively low compared to other cases. As I said, Indonesia is a, is a good example. Again, when people were asked which government should be responsible for key uh, jurisdiction, most people seem to be saying that both governments should be responsible. So again, this is a space where political forces can uh, try to convince people that the best government is central or state or region government. So again, a lot of space, a lot of uh, territory where people can, uh, where government can actually um, try uh, to get more power. So what I'm arguing is that because the opinions are not yet crystallized, there's a lot of room for the central government to increase its presence in, in, in uh, people's life. And that's what we've seen in the, last, in the last 10 years. As you can see, Myanmar is still one of the state, when we compare states, comparable states, one of the states that spends the most in defense. So defense is, the, is by far the first and most important expenditure point in Myanmar's budget. But uh, as we will see, it's spending increasingly more in healthcare and education, two of the of the policy sectors that we were covering with our survey and research. And as we can see uh, in healthcare, I think, I think it's nine times more than it used to spend and education four times more. And they were able to achieve quite impressive results in a few years only. So they were able in the uh, health sector to expand human resources, to build skills and primary health care, invested in new primary health uh, infrastructure, especially in rural areas, and that's extremely important. And we, we, can, we, uh, we were able to actually measure that very well in our survey. People feel the presence of those clinics in rural area more and more. Uh, and they were also able to establish resources for midwives and networks of midwives, uh, and, and people uh, saw that very well. And they also increased the operation and maintenance of existing hospital in every region. For education, uh, the uh, expense of expenditures have increased five times, and they were able to uh, impose uh, free and compulsory education, but also provide free textbooks and uniforms, although it's not ethnic-based textbooks or ethnic language textbook, and they were able to provide school grants to all schools, public schools, and created stipend, a stipend pro program uh, throughout um, Myanmar. So we see a lot of spending from the union government directly impacting people's life in ethnic states as well. Uh, they also increase uh, spending in telecommunication, roads, bridges, electrification. So um, <clears throat> I think that's an important point. So they are spending basically over what could be and potentially uh, state or regions uh, jurisdictions. So um, what we see that people measure by our survey is that people do feel the improvement in the last five years. Uh, especially in healthcare, education, and policing is, is a much less, uh, the, uh, the improvements were much less felt, but I will not talk about policing today, but what we can see from the survey and many other indicators that healthcare and education people do feel the difference on the ground. Uh, and women felt uh, it was about similar with the, with the general population. So there were no huge gap between women's uh, perception of, of, of improvement of public services and men improvement of public services. But what we see is a clear imbalance between local level expenditures and central level uh, expenditures. Uh, the states and regions in Myanmar only have a small portion of the total budget to spend. Um, and what we, when we compare with comparable states in Southeast Asia, we see that Myanmar is among the uh, the local governments are among the weakest throughout Southeast Asia. And what we see also is that most of the local budget rely on uh, transfers from the central government, not autonomous sources of revenue such as taxes. I think Jacques explained why, but we see that in recent years there's been an increase of uh, central level transfers to state governments. But those transfers are a bit more systematic than they used to be five years ago, where they were mo mostly discretionary by the central government. Now there's a formula for uh, transfers, uh, but those transfers are still uh, highly conditional on the size of the budget of the central government's budget for transfers. Uh, and as you can see, there's a clear dis distinction between uh, state and region's percentage of total revenue that is linked with transfers. So what we see is that the regions, especially Yangon and Mendeley, are becoming more and more autonomous because they have their own sources of revenue based on taxation, 
but the states, ethnic states, are more and more rely, uh, relying on central level transfers. So they're more dependent on central level transfers than uh, regions which are uh, located mostly in central Myanmar. So this imbalance is extremely important to understand um, um, the current situation. So to make uh, to conclude my presentation, as Jacques explained, uh, the 2008 constitution is centralized, but there's some space for decentralization. What I try to argue is that opinions about decentralization are not yet crystallized. There's no consensus about decentralization. So that was a that constitute an opportunity for central government to step in what could be otherwise uh, state or region level uh, jurisdiction. So that's what exactly what they did is that they spend a lot in states and regions. And what we're arguing is that this form of development is undermining at on some point calls for decentralization because if people are happy with the with development, there is less of a constituency in favor of decentralization potentially. So that's where we see all the political game, uh, political debates being um, uh, at right now uh, with the elections coming is that we see a central state more and more developing, people more and more happy and more and more debates about whether decentralization should be uh, the way to go. Um, so basically, that's what I had to say today. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you.